Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to the Audio Analyst. Pardon me. In my last episode, I identified 10 products that I found to be the most significant introductions in their categories over the past decade. I was a bit surprised that so many of you expressed interest and curiosity as to my selection of the Silversmith Audio Fidelium loudspeaker cables as the overall product of the decade. So as such, today I'll try to recount how our understanding of the role of the loudspeaker cable plays with its myriad of possible contributions has changed and developed as the industry has matured. Now, if you've followed my work here on the channel over the past year or so, or if you've read much of my written work over the past 30 plus years, you will be well aware that I, like the majority of my colleagues, consider cables to be a component, one that is every bit as significant as your other equipment choices, and one that can be seen to become even more definitive as you make your way further up into the systems of hyper audio class. There are essentially two distinct camps of audiophiles today, the objectivists or measurers and the subjectivists or listeners. And as I started saying back in the 1970s, until someone can show me a measurement or a group of measurements that can differentiate one loudspeaker's ability to completely disappear and portray only the sound stage from one that cannot, I will continue to adhere to the subjectivist camp. You, you may actually recall the uh, significant dust up I caused by talking about this very issue back in episodes 45 and 46. Depending on how long you've been around this hobby, you may not even be aware that cables weren't always part of the audiophile discussion. In the very late 1960s, when I first got into the burgeoning world of hi-fi, no one was even talking about wires. The virtually ubiquitous opinion of the day was that wire was wire. Now, honestly, this may have been in part because we were still just at the dawn of the age of real high fidelity. We were just starting to have access to products of ample enough quality, capable of revealing higher resolution and transparency, introducing us to a, a better understanding of what cables are capable of. But cruising all of my favorite hi-fi shops in the mid-70s revealed some interesting looking and considerably sexier and pricey loudspeaker cables than the customary 18 gauge zip cord. By about 1977, there were some interesting developments with Bob Fulton's two Fulton Musical Industries entries, his gold and brown loudspeaker cables, named presumably for their jacket colors. That same year also saw the first commercially available Litz construction speaker cable. A cable, though manufactured in Japan, was imported uh, and sold by Polk. That was known by its nickname, Cobra Cable. Then 1979 saw the launch of Noel Lee's Monster Cables, a product that soon dominated the market, and for years. Uh, back then, uh, a 10-foot pair of their monster cable speaker wires started at about $40 a set, or nearly 25 times the cost of 20 feet of standard 18-gauge zip cord, which typically sold for $0.08 cents or so a foot at that time. Now, if memory serves, the, the first record I played after installing my monster cable speaker cables uh, was the brand then brand new Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab half speed remastered Fleetwood Mac LP? Yet, as doubtful as I had been about their potential to provide any sonic improvement, I had to admit maybe the purchase hadn't been such a bad one after all. After listening to something like 10 albums or so, assuring myself that the sonic results were repeatable, I had to admit that. Although I had changed a supposedly passive link in the audio change, there was unquestionably more information. Highs were higher and cleaner, with more sparkle. And the lows were not only lower, they were faster and tighter. 
And there was a, a, a newfound nuance to everything with more detail and texture, broadband. Looking back on it now, with my electronics education and having done repairs, modifications, and circuit design while running my own electronics shop, it has become easy enough to accept. The stage had been set, and it should come as no real surprise that the realization of a world-class loudspeaker cable might follow a path akin to that taken in formula racing, requiring the unique and effective implementation of at least four key essential elements the conducting material or materials, the dielectric, the insulating material applied between and around the conductors, the mechanical terminations that allow connection to the equipment, and the resultant construction geometry, the particular final physical assembly and structure of all these materials together. Now, clearly, numerous choices may be implemented to a, a cable's design and construction that will distinctly impact each cable's unique sonic signature. And while many of these factors are known science, there may be others that seem to be seen as more art than pure science. It is not wholly uncommon for designers today to employ certain materials, techniques, or treatments without really understanding all the electrical principles or the physics involved. These remarkable claims, combined with what may seem to be unjustifiably high prices are why so many have come to distrust and doubt the cable industry in general. And while it's true that there are cable companies out there that offer fantastic sounding explanations for why their products work the way they do, there are many more who apply sawed electrical theory, mechanical and material sciences, and genuine physics to realize their products. But let's take a quick look at how we got to the point in time where a loudspeaker cable can be celebrated as the product of the decade. Through the 1970s and well into the 1980s, twin lead multi-stranded copper wire known as lamp or zip cord was the standard. People typically used the variety and gauge of this type of wire sold to them or maybe thrown in as a bonus for purchasing an entire system by the store where you purchased your speakers. Now, this wire consisted of numerous thin individual copper conductors bundled together side by side in a vinyl or plastic sleeve. Now, this was a good, tried and true, very flexible, easy to terminate wire for most installations. But what about the quality of the copper used to make those conductors? Most such wires, even to this day, are made from a grade of copper that is known as tough pitch copper. On average, TPC has about 1,500 individual grains or crystals of copper in each running foot with an oxygen impurity content of approximately 235 parts per million. Now, why do we care about individual metallic crystals, grain boundaries, and purity? Unfortunately, each and every one of these thousands of boundaries constitutes a simple circuit, exhibiting its own capacitance, inductance, and diode rectification, presenting a whole host of problems. As the signal courses through our cables on its way to our speakers, its flow is repeatedly impeded, damaged, and degraded, negotiating these boundaries between the thousands of individual copper crystals. This disruption is in large part responsible for much of the hashy and gritty sound common to such cables. And this distortion mechanism is quite dynamic. It's extremely complex and it tends to worsen over time as the cables oxidize. Now, by the late 1970s, better wire manufacturers started to use what is known as oxygen-free high conductivity copper or OFHC. This quality of copper is also referred to as 6.9s because its purity typically approaches 99.9999%. Or expressed conversely, that would be an impurity of about 1 ten thousandth of 1%. But even this variant still has around 400 crystals per foot and 
despite its name, it has an oxygen content of about 10 parts per million. Now, due to the significantly higher costs required to refine copper much further than this level, the 6.9 standard was, and is, where many manufacturers stopped. But in the mid-1980s, Dr. Atsumi Ono developed and patented the Ono Continuous Casting Process. This method employs remarkably slow casting, uh, something on the order of 1.4 meters per minute, uh, using molten copper through a specially preheated dye. The resulting slow cooling process used promotes both the creation of a single crystal filament up to 12 meters long, one crystal, 12 meters, and aids in eliminating unwanted stress crystallization. Now, he also found and pioneered an inexpensive method of purifying copper as well, allowing him to approach the theoretical limit of perfection, 99.999997%, or just three ten millionths of 1% impurity. Next, let's look at the three major electrical properties most people associate with loudspeaker cables, inductance, resistance, and capacitance as well as their inseparable interrelationships. So, inductance is the opposition to alternating current presented by a circuit. Resistance is the opposition to direct current presented by a circuit. And capacitance is an electrical characteristic that includes infinite resistance to DC, diminishing impedance with increasing alternating current frequency, and a phase lead for passing signals. Now, resistance causes equal losses at all frequencies, while inductance causes varying degrees of loss in proportion to frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the resultant loss. And although initially many engineers didn't think that the capacitance presented by typical lengths of loudspeaker cable could affect the audio range, more recent studies have revealed that such capacitance imparts a very real sonic factor, especially upon a wire's resonance. Now here the term resonance, for the purpose of this discussion, means the buildup of vibration due to energy storage and the continued vibration due to the specific periodic release of that stored energy in a circuit after the applied energy is removed. Now, Many cable designers employ any trick they can to manipulate the relationships of these three characteristics so they will have the least impact on the signal as it courses through the cables. <laughs> but you should know that there are others still who don't even think these relationships are the most significant influences on determining a cable's sound. The figure showing on the screen right now is an electrical model of an 18 gauge zip cord. It shows that per foot you have on average about 0 0.014 ohms of resistance, about 0 0.2 microhenries of inductance, and about 28 picofarads of capacitance. These values vary, sometimes wildly, with differing types of conductors and will alter during the application of the music signal. But generally speaking, a 25 foot length of standard speaker cable will have about one third of an ohm resistance, about five microhenries of inductance, and uh, about 700 picofarads of capacitance. Now, any of you out there who have ever attempted crossover design or have seen an electrical representation of one can easily recognize the remarkable similarity between our per foot wire model and a textbook second order or 12 decibel per octave low pass filter. After all, a 12 dB per octave low pass filter consists of an inductor in series and a capacitor in parallel with the load or driver. Now this arrangement allows lower frequencies to pass onto the driver while inhibiting or filtering the progress of the higher frequencies. Guys, and to this point, the only conducting material I've mentioned is copper. But 
Today, designers are free to choose from any number of other unique and exotic conductor materials, like silver, palladium, carbon, or, or even unique alloys like the new fideliums. They may also select differing sizes, shapes, or constructs of conductors. Many of those variant constructions have their own advantages and or drawbacks. But starting with bundled bare stranded wire, zip cord, while it is quite pliable and affordable, it oxidizes easily, has high relative inductance and skin effect, and a low Q or resonant point. As such, zip cord tends to destroy the, the true timing and subtle harmonic structure of the music which accounts for their typically resonant and gritty sound. But there are many other common shapes and constructs of conductors that have been in play since the early to mid 1980s. One common and popular construct includes the use of solid core wire, which offers good value as its sound is much better damped than bare stranded wire. And the sound stage is vastly improved, but it can still tend toward gritty and harsh performance. There are multi-gauge configurations, like the Kimber Cable Very Strand Cables. Litz wire, like the early Polk Cobra Cables, is derived of many fine gauge conductors, independently coated with an insulator, and they are usually fashioned with two distinct signal paths in one bundle. The constant Q, or golden ratio constant, uses conductors made of very fine strands built up in layers each successive layer a golden ratio larger than the previous and reversed in its direction. The S wire is directional. This is, of course, the bread and butter approach of George Cardis with his Cardis cables. Now, flat cables are sometimes made up of multiple strands or often made of true ribbons. Uh, uh, and they offer a fairly low overall inductance a near match of characteristic impedance and speaker impedance, and high rejection of EMI. Now, while Alpha Core Gortz and Nordos champion this design approach, both of which I've used over the decades, guys, to my ears, what Jeff Smith has accomplished with his Silversmith True Ribbons, first using silver, then palladium, now with his unique alloy Fidelium, establishes the absolute veracity of this approach. And you may have seen designs that employ a, a network approach. In these more active methodologies, an elaborate electronic network has been designed and is placed in line with the conductors in a sealed enclosure. Some are even, uh, some of these cables even have user tunable uh, options with multiple adjustment knobs on that control box. Now, this is the approach used by both music interface technologies and transparent audio, with the latter offering a tunable speaker cable starting at $72,000 a pair. Now, today's discussion doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of this topic, but I hope that it has at least lifted the veil on just how complex the interface between our amplifiers and loudspeakers can be, and has perhaps let you begin to understand just how influential that interface must be on the resultant sound of our systems. Sadly, not all wires are created equally. Now, I've included some links in today's description section that will take you a whole lot deeper into these matters. Check them out if you're interested. If you enjoy the content and information presented here, please subscribe. And don't forget to like and share links to your favorite episodes with your friends or on social media. I love hearing from you, so be sure to post comments and questions. And if you would like to support the channel, information on doing so may be found in today's description section or at my website, theaudioanalyst.com. Thanks again for taking the time to drop by and visit today. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next time, cheers.